Uh, this is Jim Rooney. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Um, welcome to this virtual conversation. Um, on behalf of the Chamber, uh, we hope you and your families are feeling safe and healthy um, during this crisis. Um, at the Chamber, as we um, adapt to this unprecedented time, uh, we do our best to be a reliable source of information or point you in the direction of people um, that are most reliable, and certainly um, this phone call uh, uh, meets that test. Uh, we also try to serve as the voice of the region's business community at the municipal, state, and federal level. And during this COVID-19 crisis, we're very engaged in activities uh, at all three levels of government. And uh, as an aside, welcome your input into anything by way of a policy reaction to uh, to this crisis that's ongoing. Um, we work hard on behalf of the business community to inform and address the most pressing issues facing uh, our region. Uh, and amidst this COVID-19 crisis, we're here today to discuss efforts to ensure the wellness of all professionals, particularly frontline and public health workers. Um, we uh, we had no idea how timely this call would be in that within the last hour, the Boston Globe is reporting um, 132 reported uh, cases of uh, positive tests among uh, Boston hospital workers for the coronavirus, 41 at Mass General, 45 at Brigham and Women's, 31 at Tufts Medical, and 15 at Boston Medical, uh, with several other hospitals that uh, have not reported data yet. So um, so this is a timely uh, conversation. So in addition to those frontline workers at hospitals, today's conversation um, will uh, include a discussion uh, about how organizations other than hospitals can support their employees. A um, few house housekeeping points to make. Um, this is a, a muted call. so. Uh, except for our speakers, uh, you will not be able to speak. Uh, it is being recorded and will be shared on a future date on our website, bostonchamber.com. Our speakers will be, will be presenting a slide deck, which you should see on your screen right now. For anyone who's experiencing technical difficulties or might have called in, uh, you can email uh, Ben Stewart on our staff at B Stewart, B S T U A R T, at bostonchamber.com, uh, and he will send you out a, a PDF copy of the slide so you can follow along. Uh, lastly, when we get to the Q and A section, uh, please submit your questions throughout the webinar uh, for our speakers. There's a Q and A feature uh, on the webinar that you should see. Uh, and make sure to choose um, send to all panelists uh, when you do send, uh, send in your questions. Um, and with that, I'm pleased to introduce our featured speaker in today's program, Michelle Williams, who is the Dean of the Faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and International Development, a joint faculty appointment at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Michelle is an internationally renowned epidemiologist and public health scientist, an award-winning educator, and a widely recognized academic leader. Dean Williams has published over 450 scientific articles and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2016. Michelle's work places special emphasis on various areas of epidemiology. Joining Dean Williams today during the Q&A portion of this webinar is former uh, state representative and chairman of House Ways and Means, Jeffrey Sanchez, who is now a lecturer in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jeffrey's also a principal of Sanchez Strategies and senior advisor at Rasky Partners, serves on numerous boards of directors, including the National Association of Latino elected officials. I have known Jeffrey for many years and he's been a leader in healthcare reform for over 20 years and has crafted laws that support enable, and enable the life sciences industry to thrive. 
Last but not least, we're joined uh, by Representative Santiago. Um, Representative Santiago serves the 9th Suffolk District of Boston, uh, but uh, his face may be familiar to some of you because he's also an emergency room physician at Boston Medical Center. Representative Santiago is a former Peace Corps volunteer, continues to serve as a captain in the Army Reserve. Um, our speakers today offer a wealth of experience, knowledge, and perspective. We're very fortunate to have them at this critical time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Williams, uh, and later we'll hear from um, um, Jeffrey Sanchez and Representative Santiago. Dean? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate the introduction and this opportunity and good afternoon, everyone. I, I also appreciate your electing to spend time uh, to participate in this virtual town hall, um, particularly during these times of crisis. Um, as you know, I'm Michelle Williams and I'm at the Dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard and I'm an epidemiologist and I've been involved in public health for some upward, somewhere upwards of 30 years. What I'd like to do is in the next 10 minutes, just frame the conversation that we will have through the Q&A with my colleagues, Representative Sanchez and Santiago. Um, if I can get the next slide, what I'd like to do is to connect some dots so that we can all um, have a bit of a background and a framing for some of the remarks uh, that I'll share and then also guide the question, answer, and discussions that we'll have. The first point that I'd like to share with us is that um, we hear as we are making our way through this crisis that we're all in this together. And to put a finer point on that, I'd like us to look at this through the lens of our economic and public health um, uh, wellness. So if you think about what we are observing unfolding as we make our way through the COVID-19 pandemic, this pandemic underscores just how interconnected public health and the economy are. And when I say this, I mean on all levels, at the local level, the national and the global level. The other point that I'd like to make to underscore just how interconnected we are and how fast moving change can occur both in the health as well as the economic domains, is the old saying about the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in one place leading to tornadoes in another place. What we're living through, what we've experienced in the last three months is essentially akin to our experiencing how enmeshed we are with the flapping of the butterfly wings in Wuhan, the ground zero of this particular outbreak having unleashed a tornado across the globe in three short months. I also want to underscore on this slide um, something that is painfully apparent, and we see our writers and our journalists underscoring this in the last week, and that is crises like these bring to stark light and clarity how continued underinvestment in health and healthcare systems can present important threats uh, to our present and future global prosperity. And this again happens on scales that are regional, national, and global. If I might have the next slide. The next point that I'd like to make um, is to just raise awareness again on the point of how intimate it means for us when we talk about being in this crisis together. I, um, I'm a native of New York and I have watched with great pride governors across um, uh, uh, here, Governor Baker, as well as Governor Como lead. And I share this, this tweet with you from Governor Como, who in his own way of leading this, this state, New York state through this uh, crisis, brings a great deal of compassion in his leadership. And the compassion I think is needed most now than ever before when one thinks about the trade-offs that are necessary in a crisis like this where resources are strained. Here he refers to the fact that his mother is not expendable and in that case, neither would your mother. 
And he is doing this because of the increasing potential tension here as some narratives around the response to this pandemic suggests that we have to make a choice between our economic health and our public health. And this slide essentially makes a point that's important, and I hope we bring this up in the discussion, that we do not have to trade off a public health strategy to attenuate this epidemic at the expense of an economic one that we have to find a way to avoid a social Darwinistic approach to solving this problem um, and to do one, solve the problem in a way that is humane, but also um, mindful of the importance of our global markets. Next slide, please. The challenges um, of this pandemic under, are, are unique in that every of almost all of the changes that we've had to make in an effort to bend the curve downward from this exponentially exploding uh, epidemic and pandemic has required us to change the way we live and work and these changes and the uncertainty that comes with these massive changes have been a challenge to the mental physical and emotional wellness of populations writ large not just the workers but the entire population and these changes, particularly, for example, um, having to co-locate one's workplace, now working from home, uh, with one's family life, brings unique operational as well as physical and emotional challenges for families, leading to increased levels of anxiety, depression, and ironically, even feelings of isolation for workers who are, are, are working remotely and for families who are not able um, because of stay in, um, uh, stay in place, sheltering place uh, policies, not able to visit. And so these are physical changes in the workplace, changes in the home life that are adding to levels of anxiety in addition to the anxiety and uncertainty brought on by the spread of the virus. Another important challenge to wellness involves parents being doubly tasked with now homeschooling and also working uh, from home and trying to explain to children the impact that this pandemic is having on their children's um, everyday life. And I'll come back to this point because I understand that many of the listeners are curious about recommendations for how to speak to children about the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, the everyday wear and tear, the stressors are likely and are already evident in triggering a cascade of adverse health outcomes in the population, the general population as well as our frontline health force workers. We are already seeing upticks in um, chronic disease um, prevalence and severity in heart disease, obesity and stroke, and already um, early uh, signs of uh, populations, people turning to alcohol and drug and potentially increasing the risk for alcohol and substance misuse. Finally, on this slide, I just want to point to the fact that this pandemic, like many other public health crises, always exacerbate social inequalities, societal inequalities, where those who are economically vulnerable, those who are house and food insecure, are acutely at risk for even more harm uh, to their health and wellness and access to resources. Next slide. Having, having spent some time talking about the challenges, I want to spend a few moments um, highlighting some of the very basic, simple ways that our faculty and others academics and health practitioners have come together to try to bring forward in an accessible and in an actionable way small steps that individuals can take to help alleviate the mental, physical, emotional stress. And I want to put an accent on the financial strain because um, as you all might have heard today, uh, the unemployment rate has gone up to $3 million just uh, in, in the short time of this early stage of the 
3 million uh, people unemployed in just the short time of this unfolding pandemic. Some simple, very easy ways, actionable ways, small steps, but impactful ways to mitigate the stress and manage the stress of the coronavirus are listed on this slide. It's important to recognize that social distancing really is a misnamed, unfortunately misnamed. What we're really asking people to do is to practice physical distancing, not social isolation. And there's a difference here in that while we might be physically separating ourselves uh, from our, our neighbors, our families, our loved ones, our colleagues at work, uh, does not mean it's not equi equivalent to being socially isolated. This is a place where technology can be appropriately used to stay connected with loved ones. And as an example in this virtual town hall, that we can continue to meet and to share and to work together uh, and while also working to uh, bend the curve and to try to break the community spread of this uh, quite virulent uh, virus. The other key important message, and it's a, uh, it's a message that is important during war times as well as peacetime, is to be mindful, to be, to practice um, breathing and calming oneself and to remain physically active. All of the basic behavioral characteristics that are equivalent, associated with positive health and well being, eating a healthy diet, um, maintaining an active lifestyle, moving when one can take a walk to take a walk, and to spend time expressing gratitude and being mindful. These are small, important steps that uh, are consistently documented, uh, well documented with health and wellness. Particularly in times of crisis, limiting one's consumption of news um, is critically important. I know that's easier said than done. I myself spend far too much time consuming the news and find that the breaking news cycle adds to um, um, anxiety. Um, and often the breaking news cycle is really a repetition of, of information that we already have consumed. So it's important to move away from the, the 24 hour, 24 seven news and allow space and time for mindfulness. In this time where we are bringing together work and um, family life into the same physical space, it's really important to create new routines, new routines that fit the cadence and uh, sequence of family life, but also new routines and new expectations for what uh, one can accomplish uh, in a changed workplace. Um, over the last three weeks, as my colleagues and I have transferred the teaching program from an in-person uh, platform to an online platform, we've been challenged, um, but in wonderful ways that promote creativity to define new normals and to try not to accomplish the same work in the same way online as we would um, if we were physically back on campus. And finally, it's really important in times like these that we are honest about our vulnerability and that we share and communicate these vulnerability and seek help when needed. I think this is a time more than ever where expressing what the challenges are and recruiting help to address and mitigate those challenges are important, particularly as we build the resilience and try to sustain ourselves through what is likely to be months, not weeks or days of working our way through this pandemic. Next slide, please. Now I change gears to talk a little bit specifically about how we might support our children during this time. And here, um, I'm sure many of you recognize the kinds of questions that children are asking um, as, as they are navigating in their own way through this time of crisis. They're asking, am I safe? Are you and the people caring for me safe? And how will this situation affect my daily life? And here, I think it's really important where teaching by example 
requires us first to control our own anxiety and recognize that in addition to the verbal responses that we give to these questions, that our actions also speak and they often speak louder than words. The recommendation from our faculty who are engaged in, in child psychiatry and sci child uh, psychology also recommend that we approach our children when they to ask them before we try to answer their questions, ask them what they know and what they are thinking. This approach uh, creates a spaciousness that gives them an opportunity to express their concerns and to give voice to their anxiety, thus providing uh, you an opportunity to engage with them in an age appropriate way and a level of concern that is appropriate to where they are coming from. It's also important in, in dealing with the children and particularly teenagers to validate their feelings and concerns and to provide reassurances where possible. In times of uncertainty, it's often important to express that uncertainty is real, it is a part of life, and that there are good people in leadership positions um, at all levels in their school settings, in their work settings, um, um, working together, coming together to try to solve problems uh, in a collective and collaborative way. Next slide, please. Now, Jim described uh, the, um, the really truly horrific statistics uh, around that's unfolding around health workers um, finally being tested and the high levels of positive um, uh, tests that are unfolding as we, um, we speak. Uh, this was a concern that I've had since uh, the 2014 Ebola crisis, um, where at the aftermath of that crisis, we learned that in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and the other Afri West African countries that struggled with that Ebola outbreak, that the first responders were the ones who had the highest case fatality rate, the highest rates of burnout, and really suffered disproportionately um, in, in return for the life-saving services that they provided to populations in need. As I watched the pandemic unfold in Wuhan, China, and similar statistics were emerging, uh, it occurred to me that there is really very few organizations that outwardly and aggressively take the responsibility of protecting frontline health workers. And it was important then for me to galvanize my colleagues across the private sector, the public sector, and academia, and start to develop a plan, a campaign, a coalition, that would address the needs of a diverse population of frontline health workers. And on this slide, I try to show that as epidemics and other crises unfold, many different people, many different groups, occupational groups that we wouldn't ordinarily think of as first line responders become responders in the human uh, capital that is involved in public health and protecting the population. And so we outwardly explicitly defined our frontline health workers to include physicians, nurses, home health aides, social workers, pharmacists, custodial workers, and even those working in grocery stores. And I can't forget those who are home caregivers, those who are non-professional, but are important providers of care and services to populations in need. It's unfortunate that we find ourselves uh, in, a, in a situation where not only were there shortages of tests to help inform our providers of who, which of their patients were positive, but whether or not they were carrying the virus uh, themselves. The lack of personal protective shortages, uh, supplies, the lack of tests, raised levels of anxiety beyond what we could have imagined for the frontline health workers. And the statistics, again, coming out from China 
with the healthcare workforce reported high levels of infection and high levels of um, mortality from the virus, but also from the exhaustive work and the stressful work um, really were um, wake up calls for us here in the US. And still with that wake up call, we find ourselves incredibly under. Next slide, please. So with, with these observations, uh, Harvard Chan School in partnership with Thrive Global, which is a tech wellness and health company and the CAA Foundation, which is the Creative Artists Agency Foundation, on March 23rd launched a program, a campaign called First Responders First. This is a two-tiered um, program, a campaign that involves fundraising as well as a call to action to raise awareness about the challenges, the opportunities to support the workforce, and also as a very important second step to promote and to enable this frontline workforce to access resources that would help them build, restore, refuel, and build the resistance for the resilience for sustaining uh, their themselves as they continue to lead us through uh, this pandemic. The program is designed in a way to provide the support necessary in real time using workshops, virtual workshops um, led by uh, professional uh, training officers and coaches and creating a space where the uh, frontline health workers can receive in real time or on their own time by accessing taped material or print material information to help them make small positive steps to building uh, their resilience. Next slide, please. Lastly, this is really an effort to provide whole human support not just to frontline health workers, but beginning with frontline health workers and extending to the population at large. Building and maintaining resilience during times of uncertainty is crucial. It's crucial both for our economic as well as our physical health, but it is crucial even in times of peace for us to remember the simple things that we can do individually and the larger things that we should um, provide prepare and provide as social safety nets or a positive work environment to enable resilience and enhance human performance at all levels. The science tells us that self-care should never be sacrificed and should never be sacrificed in times of crisis. And that just reminding our workforce that to be available to help others requires self-care it's a basic, obvious um, statement, but in times of crisis, particularly in a workforce that's um, trained to help others and is focused on helping others, taking that time to stop and to focus and to refuel and recharge is critically important. And it's one of the main reasons why First Responders First is resonating uh, so well with the population. It's also important to remember that the physical work environment the equipment, the supplies, the policies and legislation is critical, not the only uh, step for creating a healthy workforce to promote um, human performance, but that we must pay attention to the physical and emotional health and well-being and the financial health and well-being are all important and be balanced, particularly um, given the uh, interconnectedness that I alluded to in the beginning of my remarks. I'd like to just make this very important point because a crisis like this brings very clear into focus the importance of how important global, local, and national governance is. Holding leaders accountable to plan and prepare for the next crisis or the next pandemic is critical. And it's critical because it's not a matter of if, when, if the next uh, crisis will occur. It really is a function of when. We have been seeing over the last 50 years an uptick in the frequency 
of outbreaks um, here um, with flu, with Zika, and we have to be prepared. We have to enforce, support our health systems, build and sustain a human capital to respond, and really take heart to the, um, the fact that prevention is worth a pound of cure, that prevention is an important investment uh, that has many big returns on that investment across the domains of the physical, social, and financial environment. And with that, those are my remarks. I'm very much looking forward to our engaging in a conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle, for such a thoughtful and insightful um, presentation. Um, your, um, your advice and thoughts on managing stress um, have indeed prompted uh, some questions, um, and I think you I think you covered this in your opening remark on a high level. But I want to ask you to sort of dive in a little bit deep, more deeply, which is that in a public health crisis like this, stress is experienced differently by sort of different sectors of the population. Um, you talked about people on the front lines and people who are dealing with the transition to work from home. Um, um, but of course, as you, I think, were pointing out in your introduction, um, there are more vulnerable people among us. There are people uh, who've lost their job, there's undocumented um, uh, people uh, in our community who have no social uh, uh, safety net. Um, you know, what's your thoughts on um, you know, people that are in different forms of crisis in terms of um, their, uh, their tactics or, or ability to deal with the stress of the moment they are, they are in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jim, for that question. And I'm going to welcome my, um, my colleagues, um, Jeff and John, uh, to, um, to join me in, in responding. This is a major concern in public health. Um, uh, our concern would be that there are going to be for the more vulnerable populations. We've seen this before. Those who are low income uh, uh, workers uh, with very few resources, um, um, with hardly the financial resilience to manage um, the inevitable layoff as the economy begins to contract, that they are the ones most vulnerable to food and housing insecurity. They're also the ones most vulnerable in terms of um, uh, having exposures uh, to uh, these, these types of crises. Uh, this is where social safety net is absolutely critically important to help manage the, the acute needs for vitally important resources such as housing, and um, uh, food security. One of the first responses that we observed here in, in, uh, in, in the Commonwealth was as schools started to close, uh, the uh, uh, awareness that you know, up to a quarter of our kids are dependent on free lunch or um, um, subsidized lunch, we saw communities mobilized to provide um, uh, lunches for, for students, even though uh, the schools were closing. The, the access to resources for coaching and support with um, stress are very limited for this population. And uh, again, uh, services provided through our civic organizations play a very important role, but often don't fill the needs. Jeff, John, would you like to, to add? Doctor. Sure, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Rooney, thank you for hosting this um, this event here, and I want to thank uh, Dean Williams for offering her uh, remarks. I couldn't agree with her more. Uh, and I just want to thank her. For those of you who don't know, um, I got my start in public health when I was a 20-year-old college sophomore uh, because of uh, Dean Williams, and we were able to reconnect 17 years later just this past year. And so it's amazing how things run full circle. But um, as someone who represents an area of Boston that uh, has some of the richest neighborhoods in Boston, Back Bay, uh, you know, One Dalton, Prudential, 
all the way to some of the poorest parts of Roxbury where there's a 20 to 30 year life expectancy difference. This is an issue I care very much about from a policy perspective. But as someone who's also an emergency room physician at the largest safety net hospital in New England, in the business ER, um, these are communities that I, I'm very concerned about. And in fact, when we were hearing about the coronavirus and COVID-19, how it would impact uh, America, um, these are the first communities that I, I sought out that I was very concerned about. And in fact, I wrote a piece about it in The Globe. You know, how do we address the vulnerable communities? And I didn't have all the answers, but I had a number of questions. You know, for example, how do we you know, quarantine someone who's homeless? Or how do we uh, avoid eviction in someone who can't, you know, who needs to be quarantined? And as, as, as Dean Williams said, how do we pay or how do we feed kids who, are, who, who need to get fed at the school system? And so over the past couple of weeks, I mean, I've even seen my practice as an emergency medicine physician change with respect to how we treat these vulnerable communities. And I'll just give you one example, the homeless community. Two weeks ago when I was working, I got an email at three o'clock in the morning during a shift that the homeless shelters were not accepting anyone if they had symptoms. And so here I am working in a hospital in real time and uh, homeless patients are, are coming into the hospital by the numbers. And so what was I to do? I didn't have the resources to, uh, you know, I couldn't send them out if they were if I was suspicious for COVID-19. And the last thing that I wanted to see was an outbreak happen in a homeless shelter. So over the course of the past week, working with stakeholders, the city, uh, the nonprofits, and um, Boston Medical Center and Healthcare for the Homeless, We've been able to set up tents outside makeshift hospitals to really put COVID-19 patients who we, that's, that we suspect have the virus and those that need to be quarantined. And so I couldn't agree with Dean Williams more. Um, these challenges and um, how we address vulnerable communities, they need to be first and foremost in the minds of policymakers and those of us uh, in the nonprofit areas to make sure that their needs are addressed. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Representative and, and Dean and and Jim, thank you so much for, for convening this, this discussion. Um, and you know, the doctor's experience on the ground is real. Um, he's in the emergency room and he's in the community. Um, and he's seeing all of these things take place in real time. At the same time, in the other body that he works in, the legislature, you know, it's a body that was meant to be deliberative. So the challenge that exists once you get into the stratosphere when policymakers are making decisions, it's what, where, where do priorities come together? How do leaders prioritize the things that they need to deal with first? I think in the beginning of this, we saw how the, how the governor handled it in terms of, uh, first of all, recognizing it and then tackling on the immediate issues relative to the children. And at the same time, figuring out where the needs were going to happen as, as he's doing right now. In terms of what happens in a decision-making body like a legislature with the governor, they're very structured, so they they don't move. They're not as agile. But through a particular through one particular law that we have here in Massachusetts, it allows the governor to do certain things, and that's uh, the Acts of 1950, which allowed for the governor to declare a state of emergency, where he's able to do a number of things without having to go to the legislature. But one thing that does stick out is the budget process. The budget process was never was meant to be extremely deliberative. And right now, a big challenge is the resources. How do we make sure that we are set up to, to, to expend the resources necessary to make sure that Dr. Santiago and his colleagues have the protection, the, the, the personal protection equipment, as well as the ventilators and all these other things that we're hearing so that they can deliver the best possible care. Um, when they have patients in front of them while at the same time taking care of themselves and recognizing all the principles and all the things that Dean, Dean Williams mentioned a moment ago. So again, it's how do, how do we work as agile as possible? How do we make it in terms of what's happening on the ground, but also um, in prioritizing in real time so that policymakers are making decisions, the right decisions for the right time to get the resources to, to the communities, especially the most underserved among us. You. Great. Um, thank you. Um, you know, uh, Dean Williams also mentioned uh, limiting your news. Uh, you know, we have tried to promote, um, you know, locking into reliable sources of information because the more you go online and the more you listen to some of these TV pundits, the um, more confused you get. Um, so uh, on our website for people that are looking for information that are in particularly vulnerable places, um, 
is access, for example, to the CDC website, which uh, we're promoting is the best source of, of uh, medical and health information. Uh, we've created other links to um, how you can um, access small business um, loan programs and other forms of programs being put in place by government to help people experiencing this crisis differently uh, deal with it. So, um, so I would say to take a look at, uh, at what we've put up. Uh, a follow-up question on, on dealing with um, uh, stress and behavioral change uh, for Michelle is uh, we're all creatures of habit and we all have our own ways of doing things and I'm, I'm certainly one of them. Uh, Dean, what would you say is the, among the hardest behavioral changes for people to employ in a public health crisis like this, including some of the frontline workers that you've spoken about and some people in the general public? Thank you, Jim. That's a great question. But before I answer that question, let me congratulate you on, you know, identifying and addressing the issue of misinformation. Um, it's, it's critically important what you're doing in helping uh, uh, your your constituency to um, guide them towards uh, validated vetted information. This is critical, and so I applaud you for doing this. Uh, it's a major challenge for all of us, um, and I think what you're doing is is really prescient and so um, an important public service. Um, behavior change is hard for everyone and every time, and particularly hard during a time of of crisis. Um, so I would say any change is going to be hard, whether it's a change in trying to improve one's sleep habits, trying to um, increase their physical activity, or trying to change the dietary choices that um, improve the quality um, and types of foods. Uh, what I've learned and what we have learned in the science of behavior and behavior change is that it has to be personalized and it is uh, 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 a lifelong process of trying to make best choices. There are two things on the individual level is the recognition that one has to forgive themselves if they uh, uh, don't meet the resolution that's set for themselves. That's critical. Um, uh, the second is set realistic goals for change. And one of the things that uh, we appreciate about um, the, the way our, our partner on Thrive Global has developed the wellness program is they're building the program of advice for promoting healthful and well behavior by emphasizing that we who are trying to make change make micro steps to set small goals, small achievable goals, and turn those micro small goals into habits. And once a habit is formed, the opportunity and probability of success in building in that change uh, gets higher. The second thing relates to what um, Representative uh, Sanchez and Santiago alluded to, and that is, um, outside of the individual is going to be the environmental um, components that can promote and support change, promote and support choices that are healthful um, and health promoting choices. And that means creating an environment, creating a social environment, a food environment, a work environment that can help individuals make the best choice because the healthful choice is the easiest choice. And by that, I mean having legislation that supports um, uh, having fresh fruits and vegetables um, brought into communities that were once, uh, you know, uh, food deserts, to make more available healthful uh, foods um, that might have short uh, shelf life um, and might be hard for small businesses to stock, but create purchasing groups and policies that help decrease the cost for the shopkeeper um, to, to have perishable goods, but also goods that are important for communities to have access to. Um, in the workplace, um, you know, have uh, work 
structure that allows um, people to make the right food choices, but also to take um, small breaks, mindfulness and meditative breaks. Um, I will share with you that this morning, as I was checking in with my own um, um, human resources department, I was happy to see that my director of human resources has created opportunities, virtual opportunities for the staff to have sanity breaks. And so every weekday, they have a program called 10% Happier, and it's a, um, a, a virtual little sanity break that is done. On different days of the week uh, in the work environment, one can provide virtual yoga and energizing um, and restorative types of meditation and movement exercises. So it's incumbent on the individual to make an effort to make micro changes and set realistic goals and to, to keep themselves, um, to not beat themselves up if, if they fail to um, fully achieve perfection in changing their habits, but also on the work environment and the community to create spaces that support the, the healthful choice as the first choice. Great, thank you. Um, a number of questions for Dr. Santiago. People want some um, uh, insight into the front lines, doctor. Um, you know, tell us about the experience of yourself and your coworkers and how they're doing. Tell us about what we're hearing about shortages of PPE and ventilators uh, and, you know, what is going on in our hospitals. Sure, and I think we could connect that to and the topic at hand right here, particularly how we protect the healthcare worker. It's important to note that, you know, we hear a lot about testing and personal protective equipment, and those are all very important. Um, and we need those to keep a viable healthcare system to treat people, particularly as the surge is, is coming. However, if we don't protect our healthcare workforce, uh, we will not have a healthcare system. And it's important to note that even before COVID-19 was here, that physicians and nurses and the like we're experiencing already a, an incredibly high amount of burnout, of mental health issues, with drug use compared to the average person. I and mean, I went through medical school and residency, and there was a lot of talk of how we can address those issues. And I would like to, and I'd like to think that over the past um, decade, two decades or so, there's been a lot more emphasis on making sure that we're being more proactive about addressing those issues before you do burn out. And in my case, working in an emergency room, it's a very intense environment. Again, before COVID-19. I mean, just because coronavirus is here does not mean that the emergency department stops. I worked last weekend. We took care of, you know, young men who were being shot in the chest. We took care of young children who passed away. And so those are all very intense, um, can be very traumatic inducing. And to throw COVID-19 on, uh, on the table here adds a whole different layer of complexity, which makes things very challenging for a number of reasons. One, we don't know a lot about the science of COVID-19. It's not like we know the disease, we know it's genetic footprint. Um, we do know it's genetic footprint, but we don't know uh, how do you treat it exactly, what, you know, all the um, science around the, uh, the, how contagious it is. And so we're trying to answer those questions and the guidelines are evolving by the day. So that makes it quite particularly challenging. And the fact that healthcare workers are concerned for their own safety, that adds to a level of concern. I mean, I'm getting calls, friends and colleagues, physicians, nurses, uh, texts, even people who disinfect rooms who've gotten sick, who've had to go home, who've concerned about affecting their families. I just had a call from a friend of mine who was actually, you know, he's not sick, he's asymptomatic, but he's decided um, to protect his family. And I think his daughter has a, you know, an underlying health issue. He's moved out of his house. And so he's no longer connected in the way that he wanted to be with his family and his sick daughter. These are challenging challenges that the healthcare workforce is seeing. Um, daily, it's going to get more complicated for sure has uh, the level of cases arise. This past weekend, you know, I think if you speak to many emergency rooms, the volume uh, was quite down. And I think it was a bit of the calm before the storm. Um, as you know, elected surgeries and procedures, they've all been canceled. There's been a lot, you know, there's room in the hospital so patients don't have to board, which is another issue. Um, patients boarding in the emergency department. But over the course of the next two or three weeks, I think it's going to um, seriously pick up in terms of cases, in terms of the complexity. And um, I think, and I believe strongly that we're up for the challenge. You know, I think morale is still high. 
I'm excited to go to the emergency department, you know, when I'm up for a shift, which I'll be uh, this weekend. I signed up for three extra shifts in April, um, and it, more than I would I'm accustomed to doing, um, because I think this is what we're trained for. This is what we're here to do. And, you know, our, our, our patients need us, our city, our Commonwealth needs us. And so I'm prepared to, to do what we can to make sure that um, we can do the best to halt this virus. Great, thank you. Um, and the question for Jeffrey, um, uh, Jeffrey, I think you alluded to this a little bit in your previous comments, but it's this, um, you know, intersection of, of government and public policy and, and uh, our public health system. Uh, I think um, um, the dean in her initial slide mentioned the degree to which we as a society uh, have prepared our public health system for such a crisis. Uh, you've been at the front lines of this, Chairman of Ways and Means, and over two decades thinking about uh, this issue. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that degree of preparedness and maybe some of the lessons we're learning? Well, well, we've been through, I mean, here in Massachusetts, we've been through a number of issues that were pretty big. You know, I remember when, when we went through the Ebola scare, uh, you know, back, you know, back a number of years ago, the questions that existed relative to PP, the, the, the personal protection equipment, it, it was happening way back then as well. Was there going to be enough? And frankly, no, there's never enough, especially because you don't know, you don't know when it's coming. So how do you really plan for it? That's been the challenge. But when it comes to traditional public health systems, since it's prevention, it's difficult to, to invest in so policymakers, you know, policymakers, you know, don't necessarily put all the resources that you would hope that you would have to, to, to deal with the issues, you know, upstream as opposed to what happens downstream when the issue is already, you know, already at your at your feet. So we've always been challenged in that way. The strength that we have here in Massachusetts is that we have a healthcare and public health infrastructure unlike any other place on the planet. And I think that that's why when you look at how actually when Governor Cuomo put together, you know, his grid on how states are faring, uh, you know, throughout the country, and you'll see Massachusetts on the bottom, I think it has a lot to do with who we are as a commonwealth and, you know, and not, and also, you know, we're, we're spaced, you know, we're, 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 we're different than other states, but we also have a great infrastructure um, with great people and great, and great resources, very different. But in terms of the resources and, and the decision making, it's difficult, especially when you're trying to figure out in the middle of the pandemic, where do you put your money? Where do you put money, especially right now? I mean, look at all your members. Your members are trying to figure out how do, how do you keep, how do you make sure that you keep as many people on the payroll as possible? But as Dean, the, Dean Williams mentioned a moment ago, there's a significant number of people that are going on in unemployment, which means less revenue for the, com for the Commonwealth. So the, the competition for the, the inherent competition that's gonna exist throughout the entire system is gonna be pretty profound. Remember um, this first responders initiative that Dean Williams is, is heading up uh, with Thrive Global um, is trying to get at people who are at, on the ground. So think of those home care workers that are working with individuals at home, they make 15 bucks an hour. And they're working with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the same time, you have Dr. Santiago, who's a highly skilled healthcare provider working in the emergency rooms. How do you make sure that you create, that you're addressing all of those issues immediately as it's happening? Right, thank you. And um, we have maybe time for one final question. Uh, and this relates to maybe lingering or longer term impacts. Um, uh, Michelle, you talked about issues of, of mental health and burnout of frontline workers, especially medical professionals. Um, you know, this is the experience we're in it now. Um, do you suspect that there'll be some longer term impact on uh, the profession and public health and people having gone through this experience? Thanks, Jim. I think this is a really important question and I'm, I'm going to um, share uh, level of optimism here. I think this this experience, this crisis, um, has brought to the forefront of our thinking, all of our thinking about the importance of public health, 
and what is public health and why public health. And, and so much of uh, what we will learn uh, during this crisis, I think we'll have people focused on why it's important that we invest in social safety nets to protect our vulnerable populations why it's important that we think about the health and wellness uh, and the importance of having a work environment for our frontline uh, workforce that protects and preserves their capacity to serve. Uh, I, I also think that the, the, the real um, virtue of having this experience and having these conversations about why our health system does not have the ICUs or the ventilators to serve the population in light of a crisis will allow us to be more rational and thoughtful in our planning and preparedness uh, for uh, responding uh, to crises. Um, I think and I hope that the, uh, the way we are seeing the pub public galvanize around supporting the frontline health workers will be something that sustains us and attracts and maintains our young people's hope and optimism, understanding and appreciation for uh, a life and a career built around service. The leadership that um, John Santiago and Jeffrey Sanchez uh, represents um, in these times of crisis, I also think will be seen, recognized and be a, a, a strong uh, light uh, for uh, future generations. So I'd like to think that the lasting outcomes from this crisis will be a positive reset around how we manage our resources and engage in caring for one another in a compassionate, thoughtful, and strategic way. And Dean Williams, could you just also just uh, in closing, just uh, give a, a little bit on the first responders initiative so that people can give um we can uh, take a look at what we're doing and how they can help yeah thanks jeff uh, you know you can do that as well as i can because you're a partner in this well well again dean williams you start you, dean williams is at the head of our parade in terms of in terms of staying focused on getting in front of getting in front of first responders um and we're looking for partners to join us in this in this endeavor with the initiative that she mentioned in the presentation um so if you if you'd like more information, you can email me at j-e-s-a-n-c-h-e -E at hsph.harvard.edu. Um, and also, we'll ask two things. Endorse, work with us, endorse with what we're doing. And at the same time, we're, we're going to, we're going global in terms of um, fundraising and people, uh, human resource raising as well. And help us get the message out, endorse our work, help us raise money so that we can make sure that we get resources uh, to people who are working with our family, our friends, and, and our neighbors. So thank you so much, Jim, and, and everybody who's listening. And thank you, Dean Williams and Dr. Santiago. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, um, uh, Michelle, uh, um, Jeffrey, uh, Representative Dr. San Santiago. Um, this was tremendous. Thank you for your time, your expertise. Um, Jeffrey would be happy to add that information uh, up on our website as well, so we can talk offline. Um, before I close, for the listeners, I want to highlight our COVID-19 business resource page. You can go on to bostonchamber.com, uh, learn about what's going on at the municipal, federal, state levels, and uh, also, a lot of information about what your peers in the business community are doing uh, and about the effort being led by Dean Williams, Representative Sanchez, and Representative Santiago. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining. Uh, I hope this was a, a, a valuable um, call, and, and uh, I certainly learned some things. Uh, as I said, this webinar has been recorded and, and will, be, uh, will be made available. Uh, thank you all. Please stay safe and please think about some of the advice that, uh, that Dean Williams has provided to us today. Um, that ends our call today. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Much appreciated. Thank you.